So welcome, Karen. Thank you for joining us today for our Visionary Heroes interview series. Can you please tell us about yourself and your role? So I'm Karen. Mm -hmm. um, I head up sustainability for the ADECA Group, mm -hmm. which is one of the world's largest um, talent advisory and solutions companies. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been in this position specifically? In this one with the ADECA Group now, about three and a half years. Okay. And what interested you in this role? Do you have a background in sustainability? Is there something particularly that prepared you to, to want to work in this space? So I'm a lawyer by training. Okay. Um, I made the switch in about 2008, 2009 into the sustainability field. I was still working at Zurich Insurance Group at that time and really had the amazing opportunity to join the sustainability team, really help build it up from scratch. Also run the Zurich Foundation, so it gave me both sides of the sustainability coin of it to say the, the inside the corporate world, but then also looking at how we extend that on the community side. And then was briefly independent in 2016 and then joined the ADECA group in 2018. So how does a lawyer get interested <laughs> in sustainability? Not saying that they're mutually exclusive. No, it, it sometimes feels a bit <laughs> like moving from the dark side into the light. But okay. um, already during my studies, I had a bit of focus on human rights and international mm -hmm. law. And I wanted to join Human Rights Watch or the UN after my studies. Um, I had worked, um, <laughs> I had worked in a bank during my studies, and I thought never going to work for a bank again. Only thing that could be worth would be insurance. I was 25 at that time, so don't judge me. Um, and then, of course, I ended up in insurance. Um, but I always had a bit that interest in how do you better balance the interests of society with how business is being done. I just didn't know about sustainability yet, that something like this exists, that roles like this exist. And then it was in 2005 or so when I first came across it and then pursued it outside of my current role as a legal counsel at that time. And then again, the opportunity opened up within the central team at Zurich. And what was your understanding of sustainability? So you said, you know, human rights, and that was something that you were interested in as a topic. But in terms of the broader sort of sustainability, ESG, you know, what we know in, in terms of now, in terms of climate, etc. So what was your understanding? I think at the very beginning, it was very limited, right? I don't think I saw the breadth of themes that, encomp that sustainability encompasses and that it really touches on every single thing that you do. I think I still had a bit more of the focus on the, sustain uh, on the environmental side, um, also given how I moved into it. But over time, I really learned more and more, also engaging with other experts in the field that have been doing this since, you know, 1990 or so. So it's, it's certainly not Before a trend. it was fashionable. <laughs> exactly, before it was becoming mainstream. And it's really then also how industry dependent it, it sometimes can be in terms of, you know, what is really material to a specific company. And that can then shape a little bit the understanding of sustainability in that specific context. But it certainly evolved over time. The sustainability role at ADECO, a talent solutions based company, what does that look like? You know, what is your day to day? What are you focusing on? For us, the focus is particularly on, of course, the social themes particularly around sustainable employment and everything that encompasses. So starting from before people are becoming employees, so how do you actually build talent in the market? How do you upskill and reskill people for roles that actually exist? Then the whole onboarding, how do you ensure that you're really focusing on the person and don't just see them as a resource? And then the talent journey within the company, you know, how do we ensure their being looked after from a health, safety, and well-being perspective, that they have the right skills, the environment to thrive in, that we're looking after fair remuneration, that we're looking at being an inclusive company and that we don't discriminate irrespective of the factors. And it's then also moving towards when do you let people go or when um, people are leaving the company. So it's that full talent journey that is our core focus. But we're also looking at how do we bring the social factors into the environmental factors. I think that's certainly something that I'd like to see much more of that, you know, when we talk about sustainability, we often say it's about embedding environmental, social and governance considerations, so the ESG. And we see them often as silos, mm. sort of look after the E, look after the S. And I'd like to see them much more intertwined so that we also consider what are actually the social considerations in order to make that green transition happen. And for us, that is, of course, people. It's the skills that you need to invent new technologies. It's the 
you know, ensuring it's a just transition, that we don't leave people behind that might be in currently, let's say, less sustainable jobs or industries. So this is a bit the focus of my work, engaging with all our different departments to embed it into our solutions, into new services, engaging with the customers around it. And then, of course, the fundamental um, ESG considerations also into the operations. Now, skills is, I think it's a really important part because, you know, it's really hard to figure out what skills are going to be needed for the jobs of the future. So when you talk about upskilling and reskilling, what skills do you think are going to be paramount to help us on this green transition? There's, of course, the soft skills that are gaining in importance. It's the flexibility, it's the adaptability, it's the willingness to lifelong learn and upskill yourself, right? I mean, Deloitte, I'm sure something that you're talking about a lot as well. And I think a lot of people are, when they think about the green transition, they think about engineers. They think about, you know, new technology or so. But we will, what we will also need a lot more is, you know, people that work in waste management, people that know how to repair things, how to refurbish things. When you look at companies, let's say IKEA, moving from just producing furniture to recycling furniture to renting out furniture. That means repairing furniture. So you need a lot of these basic carpentry skills as well. And I think that's something that we need to be very mindful of, that it not, doesn't become an elite debate about skills, but that we really need to invest in manual skills as well. Now, skills from your perspective, I mean, the skills that you actually need to to be successful in your role, what skills are, are those? Are they similar? Are they the soft skills or what other skills do you need? You know, a bit of that negotiation tactics from your from your lawyering days. It certainly helps. Mm -hmm. I think it helps to be able to listen because you need to understand what are the needs of your counterparts in the business? Um, what are their objectives? And then how can you enable them to look at these objectives through the sustainability lens. So how can enable can I enable them to do their jobs just in a slightly different way to help us better meet the different stakeholder expectations that we have? So I think listening is certainly one of the core skills um, and the ability to humanize organizational collaboration because it's a job that is really cross-cutting across every single department, every single function. So it's your ability to really build meaningful, trust-based relationships um, within the organization that you can then draw on, because you're always trying to influence from the outside in, mm. right? I'm not part of this function. I can't tell HR what to do. I can't tell the business exactly what to do because they don't report into me. So you need to convince with the knowledge of the space, but also their needs. So it's what's in it for them to some respect. And then I think you need to be very pragmatic as well. I often like to say when you work in sustainability, you need to be a pragmatic idealist because we need to be able to hold that long-term vision of change in our heads. Right? We, I think we need to be convinced that change is still possible, that we're actually going to meet the 2030 sustainable development goals because if we don't believe in it, then who will? Mm -hmm. So I think you need to have that vision or that idealism that change is possible, but you need to be very pragmatic in the day to day. I think if you just come with high lofty goals and the ideal way of doing things, I think you lose a lot of people because they might not be at that same level of understanding of awareness if they haven't worked in this space for such a long time. So it's translating a very complex concept that sustainability is into something very tangible for them. So it's when you speak with HR, you need to really focus on the HR aspects of sustainability. When you speak with more procurement, you're gonna highlight different things. So it's that adaptability again in tailoring your messaging to your stakeholders or to your audience specifically. Mm -hmm. So presumably not everyone is, you know, all in the same boat straight away. So, you know, you probably do have difficult conversations. It probably is sometimes challenging to convince certain stakeholders that this is worth it. It is worth, you know, the maybe short term investment that, that is required. So how do you how do you do that? How do you have those difficult conversations? You need to be persistent and you really need to come prepared into the conversations. So you need to understand where they're coming from as well. I think just coming with that, I know how to do your job, I think typically doesn't work. And that's how people Never often come across, right? <laughs> Never Instead does. Of this, me telling you, well, the way that you've done your job so far, it's not the right way. We need to do it in a different way. It just doesn't go down well. So I think, again, it starts with 
building those relationships and being patient in it as well. I think sometimes, yes, it does take a year. Sometimes it takes two years to bring them on board, but it's actually often those that weren't very supportive in the beginning, if they really understand it, then become your most fervent advocates for the issue at hand, right? It's, you want to turn those into the advocates. I think the majority of people within an organization, they're passive supporters, right? If you tell them um, about sustainability and what they should be doing, they're not going to contradict you. They're going to say, yes, of course, yes, we need to do that. But then they don't do anything on it. They don't act on it. So I think that's what we need to do a lot more. It's activate and empower everyone within the organization to become a sustainability champion and have it par as part of their role. Because it can't just be one person mm -hmm. or a team mm -hmm. that pushes it. In the end, it comes down to the day-to-day decision-making of every single person within the organization, particularly when you look at ethical or responsible business conduct. That is how you interact on a daily basis. And, you know, many people ask, so what should I do in my day-to-day -day job? Just showing the respect to the other person, mm -hmm. being a human, that's how you live up to human rights, right? right? I don't discriminate against you. I look um, that you are treated well in the work environment, that you feel that you're being respected. That is one part mm -hmm. of respecting human rights. And I think that's something that everybody within your organization can do. Yeah. And then you can take it from there. Then you can build on that. But you need to be able to turn people into active parts of that, of that change. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. I mean, the whole sustainability discussion on all levels, um, it is this disconnect between words and actions, you know, consumers, you know, wanting more from, from brands, the aspect of greenwashing and stuff like that. I mean, or what needs to be done to change, you know, these kind of empty words into actual concrete actions. I mean, especially with something like achieving, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, we need far more actions and, and, and far less words. Yeah. I think you see that shift towards more accountability happening now. I think by investors asking for much more measurable data and not just qualitative stories, but something that they can really understand what are the risks that a company is, is faced with from a sustainability perspective, how a company is managing that, um, to then see what the impact on the financial valuation is. I think that is one of the big drivers right now that we see more standard setters stepping in to say, okay, what are the common metrics that companies need to, need to measure? Right, that there is some comparability that you can then also be held accountable. So I think that move towards more accountability and transparency, we see that starting to happen. Also, I think legislators are stepping a lot more in. I think in the past, it's been much more the focus of companies saying, we know what to do, let us do our thing, we don't need, need legislation because it's so complex and it needs to be tailored by industry and by, by company as well, that legislation just won't cut it, right? It's, it's too blanket an approach for what we actually need. And a legislator said, well, that's fine, okay, you do. But then we've still seen that some of the, the ways have, that we've been doing business have just broken down, right? They weren't doing justice to all the different stakeholders and needs. And I think that is why now legislators are stepping in more to say we need to create a level playing field we can't trust you anymore to do what is right because we still see that there's there's challenges also given the complexity of the issues. I think that is one of the, the new drivers as well to put more action behind the words. So in, in terms of the, I, I just mentioned before, the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that need to be done, you know, on, to achieve those 17 goals. Do you think that's realistic? Do you think that we are going to be able to achieve them in the time frame that we have? I think right now we're still too slow towards achieving the goals. I think more strategic action needs to happen at a much, much larger scale. I think that's something that people in my role often struggle with is, you know, do we just help perpetuate the current system by fixing it just enough that it can continue? Or are we really looking at the fundamentals of how business is done and really driving systems change? And I think that switch now needs to happen. I think as it becomes more mainstream, we need to be mindful of not just continuing what's been working so far, but really looking at what is at the basis of our economic system and what needs to change there. And then it doesn't just come down to, 
oh, I'm going to buy this water in that, instead of that water. Maybe water is a bad example. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to buy this product versus that product. But it's challenging some of the consumption behaviors overall, right? And how our economies are run and functioning. That is always that bigger, better, newer, but looking at doing it in more mindful and different ways. And I'm not sure we're there yet. And that's why I think it's, it's not just about turning small wheels within the system, but it's really looking at the more fundamental shifts that need to happen. And for that, you need to collaborate, not just within your industry, but also across your value chain. And it's such a huge task mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people are also paralyzed by the huge size, the sheer size exactly. of what needs to happen. I think that's a bit what we're into now. I think everybody has understood we need to act. We know what needs to happen, but it's a bit that, oh my God, it's huge. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do that? And I think we now need to sort of switch out of that, that state and really move into action back to your earlier point. Yeah. It's, you mentioned the word collaboration. I think, uh, you know, for especially for systems change, no company can do this alone. You know, no industry can do this alone. So this is why partnerships are so important. So, for example, you know, your partnership with the UN Global Compact Switzerland. Why do you feel that partnerships like that are important? Because it gives you a different perspective on things as well, right? You're in your organization. You're you're working. You're in the day to day. I don't want to call it grind, but you're in in today today way of doing business, and sometimes you um, you lose sight of the larger issues at stake, or what other things are happening. So I think partnerships with an organization like the UN Global Compact opens your mind again for all the different things that are already going on that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. But it's also then looking at how can we rather than reinventing something, it's how can we collaborate towards scale and replication. And it just also serves as new inspiration, right? As if you hear other stories, how other companies have done, have done it, it's sort of, it inspires you to do more yourself as well and to think bigger and think faster and more ambitious. And I think that's what we need as well, right? That we don't just sort of dig in, dig our heels into the way that we're currently doing it, but always have that open mind to think, what what are the external influences as well? What are we what might we be forgetting? What are others already working on where we might we might be able to bring in that that last piece mm. or a different perspective? If you think the green transition, our carbon footprint might not be the biggest one in the world. We're not a procurer of raw materials, we're not a producing organization, but we can bring in that talent perspective to say, you know. You've set out these commitments, these long-term targets, but have you considered what that means from a talent perspective? Do you have the right skills you need to make that transition happen? Do you have the people you need? How do you reskill and upskill your current workforce into these new, new roles? Where are your gaps? These are the perspectives that we can bring in and work together with our, with our partners. And I think that's, again, why we need to combine the E and the S, and then you have the, the governance factors underneath it, um, to not forget certain parts of, um, of that full value chain as we sort of transition into new ways of doing business. Are you specifically, and maybe a deco more broadly, using your, your knowledge and about future skills and this whole transition to influence your counterparts at other companies or you know, the public and private sector? Are you trying to promote those conversations through your role and also the the company that you work for? Absolutely. I mean, we do white papers. We launched one last year around the topic of green skills and what needs to happen from all different labor market stakeholders. We use this to then also engage with business associations around it. We're using it more and more to engage with our clients around this to really shift the conversation towards these aspects as well, where they might not yet have seen that they have a gap. Um, we're also engaging with policymakers around these issues. So I had the opportunity to be at the COP26 last year in Glasgow to really focus on these issues. But I think the key is that it's not just me, but it's actually also the business leaders within our organization mm -hmm. and those engaging with our clients to have that knowledge, to have those conversations, to get it out of the sustainability silo and really into the broader narrative and engagement. 
Now, most of the times companies see sustainability or investing in sustainability objectives as being a, a huge cost. You know, how do you, how do you bring, bring across that it is more of an opportunity, sort of a, a long-term opportunity as opposed to a short-term cost? It's actually interesting. I think that narrative has switched a lot over the last few years, I want to say. We just recently did a survey with our top 300 leaders to understand, um, you know, what is their baseline understanding of sustainability? Mm -hmm. So we can then better see where do we need to do more ed education of our leaders? Where do we need to bring them much better into the conversation? And nobody anymore questioned the need for this to happen. I think nobody saw it as a cost factor because they see the demand from our clients as well. Mm. A, from the compliance and risk management side. So we're part of their value chain and their supply chain. We're one of often one of their larger suppliers. So they, of course, want to understand what are we doing about the respect for human rights and managing environmental issues so they don't have an issue when they work with us in their supply chain because they, again, need to show to their consumers or clients that they have a responsible supply chain. So for them, it's from that perspective, it's more about the risk management, the compliance side, where we can differentiate ourselves from other players in the field to say, if you work with us, we've got you covered on these issues. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the opportunity side where there's more and more um, and demand from our clients to support them on their sustainability-related talent challenges or the other way around their talent-related sustainability challenges, be it around you know, access to more diverse talent. And it's not just saying, I need to hire more women or I need to hire more people with a disability, but it's then also, how do I need to change my processes for this to happen? And how do I need to change my culture for that talent to then actually thrive within the workplace? Because you can't just bring them into the organization as if nothing happened. You also need to look at where has your system broken down before that they weren't attracted by your organization or didn't stay in your organization. So these are some of the questions that we engage a lot more on with our clients. What does sustainable employment mean and what are they missing um, in that area? The study you just referenced, you said cost is no longer a consideration. Everyone understands the importance of it. Where are the gaps still with the C-suite? I think it's not so much the C-suite. Okay. I think they're, because they're exposed to so many of these developments in the fora they engage in, in the high-level client conversation that they have. I think it's, and that's been true for the last 10 or more years, it's that, that layer in the middle, right? It's the middle managers. Because often it's the targets that they're given are not yet aligned with that sustainable thinking. So they feel the pressure to just deliver numbers versus also looking at how are you actually delivering those numbers and what are you being rewarded for. And I don't, th I don't want to say that it's, it can only be incentive dri driven, right? We want to have the right leaders in the organization that are not just doing it because they're being rewarded for it, because they intrinsically think this is the right thing to do and is in the best interest of all our stakeholders, mm -hmm. including our organization. But it's, I think that's where still a lot of the gaps are that they don't know how to translate what we're telling them into something very concrete in the day to day. And I think that's where we need to do a much better job to what I said earlier, it's translating this complex concept into what does it mean in your specific day job? How can you turn this into action? And how can we better support you on that? And I think that's where we still have a gap. But I would think that would be like a leadership gap per se, because, you know, if the top has decided that this is very important and they see no issue with it, but the middle managers are seeing a disconnect between what they need to deliver um, and, and sustainability objectives, then there needs to be something that's happening at the top saying, let's prioritize, you know, the sustainability objectives as opposed to only focusing on, you know, profit objectives, for example. I think you need to integrate them, mm -hmm. right? I think... They, they should be one and the same rather than seeing them as separate, you know, mutually exclusive issues or so. And I think that's something that we need to do much more of. How do you really bring those together? And in the end, we also need to recognize that change is hard, right? Mm -hmm. I think many people have been working in their jobs for many years and now suddenly you're telling them, oh, you, you know, you need to do that slightly different. And it's hard. Changing your behaviors mm -hmm. is really hard. We know it from ourselves, right? I mean, every year, beginning of the year, most of us are taking some sort of New, New Year's, Year's resolution. resolution. <laughs> and then a few weeks in, 
we drop them. And mm -hmm. this is something that you very individually can control. Mm -hmm. It's something that is in your, um, you know, in your power to change. And yet look how difficult this is. Mm -hmm. And now you're asking to change business behaviors that have sometimes developed over years or decades. It's a huge tanker that you're trying to shift from going here mm -hmm. to going here. And I think that's something that we need to be mindful of as well, that we don't overwhelm people from one day to the other, but bring them on board. And yes, it's frustrating if it takes a little bit longer, but I think it will really pay off over the longer time if you take the time to invest at the very beginning and then be able to shift this all together that it then becomes a bit of a self-starter as well. I think that individual choice is also a, an, is also a challenge that we face. You know, consumers want to be more sustainable. They want to make more sustainable choices. They want to have the information to be able to do so. But as you know, your point about New Year's resolutions, it's hard to change behaviors. So, you know, you can want this in theory, but in practice, changing things that are comfortable for for you as individual consumers is sometimes very difficult. So, do you think it is possible? And, you know, with this whole information overload or, you know, this, this thought of everything is doom and gloom, how do we help consumers or companies or individuals or, you know, society in general to be able to see the positivity of these, you know, small changes that are just necessary? I mean, it's a huge question, right? I mean, I think that's what um, governments have struggled for a long time, particularly when you look at Switzerland, you know, how do you get people to vote? Because many people think, what what difference is my single vote going to make, right? It doesn't matter anyway. And I think that's the same that we're seeing here, people thinking it's my individual behavior. I mean, that's not going to move the needle. And I think, of course, you need the big fundamental changes by corporations, by systems, by industries. I think we shouldn't forget that and just put the onus on, on individuals, right? I think that would be the wrong way as well. But I think you as an individual have a lot of power when it comes to you know, pension funds. How is your money being invested there? Where are you investing your money? Um, how you consume? Where do you consume? It's showing that it makes a difference as well because if everybody thinks that way, Nothing is, of course, going to happen, but it makes a difference if 20% 20 pe 20 of people are moving in a certain direction or wording, um, voting in a certain way, or is it 80% or 55 You send a signal as well to producing organizations, um, to um, you know, governments as well, where you need to step in and do something. And I think by that, you as an individual can make that choice as well, and you have Yes, it might be a tiny lever, but I think if more people are doing the same thing, I think it can have an impact on what companies are then also producing if they see something is no longer being asked for. So I think it's, on the one hand, the intrinsic change of corporations into a certain um, new way of doing business that is necessary, not just because it's being demanded, because sometimes you also need to educate your consumers about a certain choice. Um, or what might be more meaningful than something else. But in the end, it's also about your personal behavior and how serious are you taking what is happening or is potentially happening. And I think that's where, particularly in a privileged society like Switzerland, I think it feels often like this is so far away. You know, what impact am I going to have and how is it even going to impact me? Mm. And I've earned this trip to the Maldives, right? I've worked so hard. I need a treat. Um, and I'm not saying that a trip is bad, right? Because we also know that with COVID lockdowns, it has a huge impact on so many econom economies and the livelihoods of people because there weren't any tourists anymore. And you also need tourism for cultural exchange. So I'm not saying travel per se is bad, mm. but I think it's being more mindful of your choices in the day-to-day. -day. And yes, maybe sometimes you need to make a sacrifice to in order for the greater good, but then also that your children and the next generations still have access to the same opportunities as you've had. And I think that is often the step that many people don't yet do. What will it actually mean for the next generations? In the media, climate change and any climate related aspect is what gets a lot of the attention, you know, the, the forest fires, the hurricanes, things like that. That is what a lot of people equate initially when they hear about sustainability, but the whole social aspect, as we were talking about um, in the beginning, 
especially when it comes to employees retaining or attracting talent. Um, the social aspect, especially for the younger generation, is becoming more important. And that's why there's discussions about four-day work weeks, which is something New Zealand is thinking about doing, or um, only working a certain percentage of time, or being able to, you know, job share, job rotate, things like that. In, in your experience and, and basically in a deco, are you seeing that as well? Are these conversations coming up with companies saying, you know, how do we make employment in the future attractive or even employment in the present attractive, you know, to maintain and retain our staffing level? Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a huge issue at the moment right now, right? In the U.S., you hear a lot about the great resignation, great resignation or more yeah. the great reevaluation, as we like to call it, mm -hmm. where people are really taking a step back and looking at what do I actually want out of my life? Is it what does what is the role that work plays in my life and how much are, am I willing to give in compared to what I'm getting out? So I think that's certainly something that we're seeing also when we do surveys last year we did again a survey of 8,000 people to understand you know what are the expectations as workers from their employers and then where are the gap to what is actually happening and I think it is that people want more flexibility it is whether it is in where they can work or how they can work you know how many hours in a day or is it can I work from you know I'm an early riser can I work from six to 10 and then have a bit of a break to go out with my dog and then work again longer in the evening or I have children. So I need that time in the later afternoon to spend with them, but then I'm going to log on again late at night. And I think that is where we see more um, push from employees in terms of what does good employment or sustainable employment actually look like or what it should look like. And I think that's a trend that we've been seeing I want to say over the last few years is that rise in worker voice. And I think that's what employers now are recognizing as well, that people, they're not just a resource, right? It's not just a raw material. It's mm -hmm. not concrete, a brick or a flower that you can just use. And then if you have no longer use for them, you just chuck them away. But it's really something that you need to invest in, that you need to continuously build that relationship with your employee, that it's not no longer just sort of this this top-down relationship of employer-employee, but it's becoming more of a partnership where you realize you benefit both from each other and you both need each other. You as an organization need adequately skilled talent to, you know, to be able to produce, to be able to serve your clients or your consumers. But on the other hand, um, employees also need employers you know, to actually be able to live their lives and, mm -hmm. and gain some livelihoods. And I think that is what is where we're seeing a fundamental shift in terms of that relationship between employer and employee, that it becomes more, to some extent, more one of equals. Um, at least that's the way that I would like it to see, um, rather than just sort of a top-down relationship where one dictates the terms. I think we're still a bit away from that. It also depends on industries, on roles. I don't just want to take a privileged Western, Western perspective mm -hmm. on it. I think we need to be very mindful of that as well. But it is a bit of a shift that we currently see happening that when workers come in, and particularly during COVID, we're risking their lives, um, you know, to do a job. They have higher expectations of um, how are they are being treated or what is happening as part of their working lives. And where we then see the gap is that, particularly when it comes to you know mental health or so, that leaders are often not equipped to deal with this new expectations of their workers. To how do you lead? How do you support? when your whole team is remote and you no longer get that direct sense for mm -hmm. another person and to building those really human relationships mm -hmm. with each other that are so powerful to then move it forward. And I think that's where we need to invest a lot more into the, the soft skills as well of the leadership. I think that's not something that we should forget. And then as well, how do we ensure the systems that are running underneath it enable that as well. Something that we very much see is that investment in people from a financial imbalance sheet point of view is still treated as a cost. So the incentives for organizations are much, much smaller to really invest in the upskilling um, of their employees because financially it might not necessarily make sense. And it could be you invest in your employee and then they leave anyway 
can go, go work somewhere else. And I think it's how do you really ensure that also from a financial perspective, it's not seen as a cost, but as an investment, and that we see each other um, more as a system as well, where yes, it may be that you invest in an employee and that person leaves, but the same happens the other way around. Mm -hmm. We benefit as well from other companies investing in their talent and ensuring they have the right skills to still succeed in the labor market. I think that's where it's opening up a little bit more as well than that corporates don't just see each other as competition anymore, but also being part of that same, same ecosystem mm -hmm. that we need to better collaborate on. Which is interesting because actually, yes, investing in training is more is expensive, but retaining employees yeah. is, is far more cost effective in the long term. Yeah. It's typically three times, actually. It costs you three times as much to bring in somebody new exactly. and to train them and until they know the, the cultural aspects of your organization as well and how things work and to really be effective in their jobs, then we end up skilling their, their current employees. I think that's what we see as well. It's the the retention of employees becomes so much more important and the upskilling and reskilling and moving away from that hire and fire culture mm -hmm. that we've seen maybe over the last decades or so. I think that is thankfully moving a bit more to the sidelines and really seeing people as, as people. Now, you mentioned, you said something like, you know, this is how it should be or this is how I would like it to be. If you could think about, you know, the ideal sustainable organization from a talent perspective, how would you design that? I don't want to give away everything that we're currently working on. <laughs> was, I, was, I was asking based on your opinion. Um, but I do think it comes back to that element of sustainable employment, right? It's not What does just, that mean? It's looking at that the, the full journey of somebody with your organization as well. And it starts with sustainable employment from the employer perspective. It starts with what I said before. It starts about you know, ensuring that the right skills are in the labor market for you to be able to function as an organization. So it's not just focusing on your specific employees that you want to bring on board, but it's investing in that talent ecosystem right beforehand. So again, coming back to partnerships, working out with universities, mm -hmm. with, with schools, with secondary education, with apprenticeships or so to, to partner, to build this infrastructure as well that you can then benefit from as an organization. And then it goes to when you recruit, you know, how does recruitment actually happen? Are you respectful of that employee? Are you mindful of non-discrimination? Is it around fair remuneration? And remuneration, not just in the sense of that one salary, but also social protections. You know, how are you, um, what is really that gold standard for workers look like or how you should treat them? And then what happens when they are with you within your organization? How do you ensure they thrive in the day to day? But it's also when you, you know, go through a reorganization, do you just, again, let them all go and try to find a new talent in the market when you move to more circular business models? Or do you actually say, no, we have a commitment to our people and we're going to look after them, we're going to invest in their up and reskilling, whether that then happens in our own organization or to enable them to find some, something somewhere else. So I think it doesn't just stop when the employment relationship then ends, but how do you ask, also look, um, look after people once they've left your organization and how do you invest in that ecosystem as well? And I think that's where employers can play a much, much stronger role in really understanding the breadth of their responsibilities towards their workers as well. That it's not just a commodity that we're using and harnessing at a, at a very specific moment in time, but how do you actually build partnerships with your employees as well? Is that something that frustrates you is, you know, trying to get across that employees aren't commodities, you know, they're, just, they're not cogs in, in a system. Is, is that something that frustrates you? Not so much anymore because we see it shifting, okay. right? You also see the language shifting. I think for me as a lawyer, words carry a lot of weight, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of meaning. And the more you talk about human resources, I think the more it also gained that connotation of, yes, it's a resource, it's a commodity, right? It might not be obvious, but I think it's sort of this underlying feeling that you have. And it's just sort of that sense of this is how we're treating them. And I think now, you know, people are trying to find different language for that as well that clarifies in different ways what, they, what people mean to them within the organization, whether you then call it talent or assets or people. 
Um, but I think it's it sometimes language helps you shift certain actions as well. But it sometimes also has to be very deliberate um, in terms of shifting the language. And that that's where I'm then very lucky that I can very directly work with our communication colleagues as well that very much shape the narrative of an organization um, to really then perpetuate a new way of how we're talking about certain things. Words, words definitely matter. So in, in the three years you've been in this role, you said you're seeing the shift, you're seeing people having different mindsets in terms of why this is important and the, the long-term benefits that it does bring. So are you overall optimistic in terms of what the, and what the future holds in the sustainability space in your role, in your function? No, I think generally, yes, I am very optimistic. I mean, I've been in this field for more than a decade um, and I've seen how difficult it was in the beginning, how it's really sustainability was either simply associated with giving back, which also has a very patronizing you know, undertone, again, coming back to language carries a certain weight um, or meaning. And, you know, that community investment or it was purely associated with managing your environmental footprint at a very, very high level and, you know, saving a bit of waste. And I think we've really moved away from that. I think you mentioned it before, it's become a bit more mainstream. Um, and I think that's what is needed as well. I think people recognize more and more that it's not something that you can treat separate from your core organization, but it's a lens that you should put across everything or look um, a lens that you put across everything and look through to then see how do we need to shift the way that business is being done. So I don't think it's a trend. I don't think it's a mega trend, but it's really a way of looking at how business should be done in the interest of all your different stakeholder groups. Um, and so from that perspective, I am optimistic because I think I see how people are reacting to it much, much differently and they recognize the seriousness of it as well. And it needs to be firmly embedded into the core of an organization. But I think many people still struggle because of the complexity of what it all entails, that it isn't just this one tiny thing that you can then take off, but it's it's a multifaceted approach that you need to take and really see see how it touches every part of your organization. And, you know, when I started out, there was always the saying, you know, we working in the sustainability field should be working towards us no longer having a job. I mean, yes, that would be the ideal, but I think there's always new topics coming up that require to be looked at from a sustainability perspective where a lot of people might not immediately go there. It's because of new technology that evolves or new societal movements that come up or um, some other factors that need to be considered as we move forward. So I'd say, yes, there's probably a while that these jobs will be around, but yes, ultimately it should be part of everybody's role, right? It should be part of everybody's job description to do the way that they do their jobs in a sustainable manner. I was just going to ask you that, you know, should it is it, should it the role exist as its own function or should it be something that is embedded across all departments of an organization? But you, you just but covered that. I think it's also because you want to ensure alignment, right, mm -hmm. across different things. So if, let's say, it is fully embedded and sales and the client engagement moves in one direction, you want to make sure that this is also reflected on the procurement side and the supply chain direction. Or if you take an insurer, where is my background, right? If you say it's the underwriting side, if you say we're no longer going to underwrite this and this types of business, you then don't want to uh, go on the investment side and say, yes, but we're still going to heavily invest in those industries. And I think this is something where um, the sustainability function can also play a key role in bridging um, those gaps or sort of ensuring those communication lines and that alignment across the full of an organization. Because there is a bit of tendency, right, that people, they're so excited by it that they then run off in all different kinds of directions, mm -hmm. but you still want to make sure that you as an organization are moving in the same direction, that you're focusing on your priorities, that you're not sidetracked by smaller things, um, but you're really focusing on the most material issues for your organization where you can have the biggest impact. I think that's where sustainability functions also play a key role 
in keeping it together, ensuring that you're sharing the same narrative, moving in the same direction, and that there's alignment across the different things. And what are those material issues at ADECO? It is everything to do with employment. Of course, it is the social issues. I mean, for us, as one of the largest employers worldwide, I mean, we employ or we place about 1.2 million people every single day into jobs. So it's, again, how are we doing that? How are we ensuring that they're being look, looked after in the jobs that they didn't have at our client site? Um, same also then with our own employees. So it is the social factors that are most material to us as an organization. The respect for human rights, the, um, the, the fair employment, fair remuneration, the respect for human rights, um, but then also how do we bring that into the environmental side around the upskilling and reskilling. So our overall purpose is to make the future work for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Not just to make it work for shareholders or for clients, but really for everyone. That also includes society at large, right? And the environment. And for us, that is then looking at particularly the social issues within an organization, not letting the others slide, but it's really the emphasis where we can have the biggest impact in terms of ensuring the lifelong and sustainable employability mm -hmm. of people that even if the world changes because of climate change, automation, digitization, that they still have access to employment, have the right skills to stay in employment as the world changes and by that have access to livelihoods, right? And then how do we support our clients to navigate this fundam fundamentally changing landscape from a talent perspective? That's where we as an organization can have the biggest impact. And then, of course, sorry, one more point, <laughs> which I've gotten a bit nerdy on in the last years is around, you know, how do you pay your taxes? I think it's certainly not one of the most sexy topics, but I think the responsible tax payment is such a huge contribution to sustainable development. And we, particularly when you look at it from social charges that we pay on wages, I mean, that's a huge contribution that we make towards sustainable employment that can't be forgotten. So it's how do you structure also these type of practices in terms of responsible risk management, in terms of responsible tax management, um, to ensure that you really make a positive impact towards sustainable, um, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And my final question that we ask all of our visionary heroes <laughs> is, what would you like your legacy to be? My legacy? Oh. I'm not sure it really has to do all that much with sustainability, but for me, it's more about being remembered as a person, right? I don't just want to be seen as a machine or she was really great at delivering a strategy or developing this program, but that I always treated people with the right respect, that I was always accessible for everyone within the organization. And that's what I would like to be remembered by as a human, right? That took the time out even if we're in very busy times and very hectic jobs and huge expectations to still make the time to engage with people. Because that's what in the end it, it is about, particularly for us as the ADECO group, right? It is about people. Um, so it's maybe something much smaller, but I think it's pushing for the good in others as well mm -hmm. and hoping by that inspire others to always remember to treat each other, treat each other as, as human beings. And it filters into those whole interpersonal skills, which, you know, exactly. end up influencing the S and the ESG. Yeah. So. And it then hopefully has that ripple effect as mm -hmm. well, right? If you treat each other with respect, you're, you tend to listen much more actively. Mm -hmm. You're more present uh, in the company of others. You give them the time of day as well. And then, you know, that then translates into other actions happening as well. So it might seem very small and trivial, but I think in the end, it can have a huge impact as well. So for me, it's not just, oh, you know, I've led the ADECA group and then they're the most sustainable company there is mm -hmm. or the most sustainable employer because it's always, that is always a team effort, right? Yeah. That, that doesn't just depend on me. I can be that start of that ripple or mm -hmm. that start of that wave that empowers others and enables others to do the things that they need to do, right? I don't develop new new products. I don't change processes. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to empower others to do that mm -hmm. and actually sit at those, those levers of power, I want to say, to make those changes happen. And I think it's how you then do that in your day-to-day -day job. I think that that's what it comes down to in the end.
working together for a more equitable society. Yeah, not sure how visionary that is, but I think no, I that it, it is that, for me, it's really that human-centric absolutely. that we need to have a lot more and that we're not seeing enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's if you forget that we're all people, I think mm -hmm. we're talking about organizations and corporations or so, but they're made up of people. Absolutely. And yes, you can say somebody is in power, is the CEO, and somebody isn't, but they're still all people, right? Mm -hmm. I think we share a lot of commonalities, maybe not from a role Far perspective. Far more than what divides us, actually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think if we recognize that more, I think we're also much more mindful in how we're doing our jobs and much more conscious of the impact of some of our actions on mm -hmm. others. So also when we talk about green transition or so, it's how do we ensure it's a human-centric one, mm -hmm. that we don't leave people behind. And it starts with actually thinking about people. Thank you, Karen, for your time. I mean, this was a very great discussion. And words matter. And I really like how, you said, how yeah. you said that. So we wish you all the best in your thank role. You. And thank you for having me. I mean, it's, you know, I love these topics, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, and you need that level of passion to, you know, to push forward in a role like this. Because sometimes it really is exhausting. Um, it's you hit your head against the wall many, many times if you're not really making the progress or it's frustrating. Um, so you need to have that passion to sustain you, to use that word again, in your role. And I hope that I can infect others with that passion as well, that they see as well how they can take their values and bring their passion to work and turn it into something meaningful rather than just being cogs in the wheel. Well, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Well, we're very happy that you have that passion to inspire others. Best Thank of you. luck. Thank you.